Come on, let's put our hands together for the King of Kings. It's always a good idea to praise God, amen? It's always to our advantage. And uh, why I'm so excited that you're here, all people online. Let's put our hands together for those people online. Look how special you are. <laughs> and there are people that are listening from around the world, and I want you to realize that. And so um, count it a, a huge privilege for those of you that are online. Um, oftentimes we have people from the Philippines, and we have people from certainly the mainland and different parts of Asia as well. And... Uh, and so it's always a blessing. Every now and then I have a pastor saying that I'm from there, here, here, you know, like from the Philippines or someplace else, Singapore, this, and this, and I just thought I'd let you know it's a great message. I said, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, I don't know who's all listening. Are you ready? Yes. I am ready. I am ready. So thank you. Thank you for coming. If you're here for the very first time, I hope you sense the welcome that uh, our church has for you. We do appreciate you. It's a place. We like to call it a church you can call home. And uh, we just appreciate you coming into the house of God. It's his home. Amen. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus and thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Lord, you never fail us. Lord, already in the worship, our hearts have been moved and shifted and things of an expectation have begun to rise up and we're ever so thankful. Always for your salvation. Always for the unconditional love you have for us. Your mercy. Your grace. Now I ask that you would, by the power of the Holy Spirit, his very person will move around us. Comfort your people. Strengthen your people. Holy Spirit, thank you so much that you move in the name of Jesus. Help, counsel, strengthen each and every individual in this room, regardless of what it is in their hearts, speak to us. Speak to us in a way that your word would not just be words, but that we would hear the life of your word and receive the life of your word because your word has been designed to nourish us, and to strengthen us. So we thank you for that. In Jesus' name and everyone in agreement said... Tell your neighbor you're looking amazing. What happened? Tell me what your secret is. Amen. Well, as said a moment ago, you know, in a few days we're going to be, yeah, this is day 40, 34 days until our anniversary, the launch. Amen. And God is going to pour out um, an amazing, just... Uh, Oh my gosh, it's already, he's already moving. I got to be careful here. But um, he's going to pour out in an amazing way. And, uh, and so, listen, we would like everyone in this room, whether it's the first time you've walked in, or maybe you're hearing us for the very first time online, we would invite you all to be with us. Something, something, um, how would I say, without, I'm not trying to be sensational, something very, very powerful, very, very special is going to happen by the power of the Holy Spirit. We're coming together, you know, as a, as, as a family. And I don't just mean just we're like yep, churches from mainland and people and are coming, but something different. You know, it's a closing of a season and an opening of a new one. But the Bible says when we gather together in unity, there in the place of unity, say unity, meaning we're in agreement or all around Jesus Christ, right? It's not about denominations, it's not about organizations, it's about Him. It's about, all about Jesus, amen? When we come together, He says, when you come together, there's something there, say there. And uh, it's called the precious oil. The precious doesn't mean like sweet, nice, cute, no. It's talking about rare and uncommon. It's talking about the anointing oil that drips from the head down, that comes down. Say it's going to come down. But you, how many of you know that God can, uh, can send oil up? He can send it any way He wants to. And, uh, but the point is, the Bible says that when that happens, at that place, at that time, what begins to happen, he, he says, there he commands the blessing, life evermore. Say the blessing. And so it's important that you and I get a hold of that and pray that you'll understand maybe a little bit of what 
places like that, times like that, seasons like that. If you've not been with us, we talked about two different times in the Bible, the Kairos time, the calendar, and the, sorry, the Kronos time, the calendar, the scheduling, the time on the, you know, watches, and then there's the Kairos time, the God timing. So let me hold there and get into this. This is my assignment. So I once heard it said by a, a, a really powerful minister of the gospel, impacted my life greatly. He said, don't be so problem-minded that you can't see the victory. Don't be so problem-minded that you can't see the victory. If I had a, a way of maybe readjusting some of the words, I would have said it maybe, don't be so mountain-minded. You know, mountains in the Bible are like problems. Don't be so mountain-minded that you can't see the miracle that God has for you. Can I have an amen? You see, you can't win a victory, he went on to say, when the problem or the mountain is the biggest thing in your life. Sometimes we don't realize what's going on. And I pray that God would use this service, this, this, this time of ministry, uh, to, to help maybe some understanding come to every person in this room. Um, I'm going to go on the limb. I'm going to say that God is definitely on the move. He's definitely on the move. And miracles are at hand always. And when, you, when you put the name of Jesus there, a miracle is right there. Amen. Jesus is Lord over Hawaii and will always be, no matter what goes on on any level, because he is consistently constant. His word is consistently constant. His word does not fluctuate with politics, doesn't fluctuate with cultural fads, it does not uh, fluctuate with circumstances, good, bad, or indifferent. His word is consistently constant. And that's why, you know, of course, Jesus is the word. The word is Jesus. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. It's John chapter 1. And that's why the Bible says in Hebrews 13, it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if you ever read of a miracle that he did, any time that was a yesterday, it's good for today, and it will be good for tomorrow. Amen? And yet, um, <clears throat> there is something really stirring in my heart for, for people here, and I believe that there is breakthrough, not just for people here in this place, but for our state, and for our nation, and for the nations of the world. With all that's going on right now, worldwide, God is not nervous. God is not shaking. He's not slipped off his throne. He hasn't put his hands to his head and said, oh my gosh, what's going on? <laughs> oh yes, sir, let me tell you, ma'am, he is still in control. I said he's still in control. And um, it's important that we not miss what God is endeavoring to do by being so problem-centered instead of being Jesus-centered, instead of being Word of God-centered, instead of being miracle through the hands of Jesus-centered, instead of being faith in God-centered, instead of being Word-centered, all right? We need to get our eyes back on, some people sometimes refer it to the basics, but it's not the basics. It's the foundation that you build your life on, the Word of God. Come on, somebody. And um, the Bible, the Bible don't, talks about, and this is what I'm going to get to. The Bible talks about there being interruptions and disturbances and uh, distractions. And sometimes we measure what God wants to do on his timing by a chronos. Versus the kairos, the chronos meaning your calendar or the days or the months and the list goes on. Versus what God is saying, hey, get ready. I'm going to do something powerful in your life. And I really want to help us to all understand that because some of you de definitely lead that. I mean, some of, I'm not saying you, if you don't want it, I'll take it all because I want everything God has for me. And so, you know, 
The Bible says, for example, let me share with you real quick. So you would know this. First Peter chapter five, verse eight and nine. We won't turn it on scripture, but just a reference. And it says that um, <clears throat> Peter, by the Holy Spirit says, be vigilant or be awake. For your adversary, the devil, is like a roaring lion. Say, like a roaring lion. Meaning, he's trying to be who he is, and he is not like the lion of the tribe of Judah. But he, he the like a roaring lion, is making a lot of noise. And that's what you're hearing. In real time, in a real way, you're hearing, whether it's on media, whether it's on television, whether it's people talking, communities, groups, however it is, chat rooms, however it is, about whoa, 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 what's going on? Where is God? Right where he needs to be, on his throne, the throne of your heart. And I want you to see something that's important because we are surrounded, I don't deny that, with loud voices of the world that are attempting to rob the vision of your victory in Jesus and push it out as a non-reality, an untangible reality, trying to get you to buy into the worry and all the dialogue. The goal is to distract you, interrupt you, disturb you by choking his word out of you and trying to get you to get caught up in the cares of this world. This is all Mark chapter four. When that happens, something begins to subside on the inside of us. Our expectation, our hope for what God says he will do, our faith in God, you know, the power of his promise, and the list goes on and on. And then as we slowly, sometimes it's subtle, Things begin to erode around us. Things begin to cave in on us. And so um, crying about the problems of this world will not solve it. Complaining about the woes of this world cannot solve it. You know, trying to give the devil credit for all the evil in this world will never solve your situation. Because we're victorious in Jesus. But I want to help you to understand how this plays out in your life. And so he's trying to get you away from a visitation, an appointment that he wants to have with you. And there are several you'll have in your life. And I'm going to give you a glimpse of your life with the help of the Holy Spirit. this morning. And it's very important that, that it's a simple message, but I believe it's a timely message. So I'm going to begin... In Luke chapter 19, and it's going to go up on the screens in just a moment. I believe it's right behind me. It says, and Jesus is speaking here. Then, as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice. Sounds like word of life right there. Anyways, um, with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace. And we say peace. peace. In heaven and glory in the highest. And then some of the Pharisees called to him, meaning they shouted to him. They called to him from the crowd. Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said, I tell you that if these should keep silent, that the stones would immediately cry out. Now, as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over the city. It's referring to the city of Jerusalem. Saying, if you had known even you, especially in this day, in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For Days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know 
the time of your visitation. It's interesting that Jesus comes to, of course, his people, and he comes to them as he comes to you, but he's, he's speaking to them. And it's important that you understand that this your day here is your day now. And it says that um, in this your day, if you had known even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace. And it's important that you and I realize this. Leonard Rabin here once said, the opportunities of a lifetime must be taken in the lifetime of the opportunities. Apparently, they did not take the opportunity of a lifetime in the season of its opportunity. So often, we miss those opportunities in our lives. God is present. God is willing. And we don't take the opportunity of a lifetime. There are reasons for that. There is a distractor. There is an interrupter. There is... A, you know, a disturber. But in this passage, the verse says, you do not know the time of your visitation. And um, this, to me, has been an impact on my life for many, many years now. And um, it's a real, whew, don't want to get there. I'm sure I've been there at times. There's no doubt, without any question, I've been there where I've missed the Lord, when he was moving and I was just had a different mindset. And, and the only way you can get out of that is to repent. Praise God. When he repents, he forgives and we move on. Amen. But Jesus here is, is giving you and I a wake-up call. He wants you and I to understand that you don't decide the times, the seasons of the breakthroughs and the miracles. You don't decide with your casual approach to God, when you're going to do God's will. God decides. He chooses, it says in Daniel chapter 2, verse 21, the times and the seasons of the shifts and changes. And there are times when he comes. Now, he's already come, the fullness of his salvation. But there are times when he speaks to you and something happens we don't necessarily regard for various reasons that are, that will make so much sense in so many ways, but it leaves you out with the visitation that you actually needed. Jesus is encouraging us. Say encouraging. Say it again. Say it again. He's encouraging us. Do not miss those chiral moments that I want with you. Do not miss what you need. Because he says something very, very, very powerful. And I'm just going to mention it. And it's not my full. He says, in this day of yours, he came to his people. He came to Israel. He came because they did not have the peace that they thought they had. They had religion. They had some levels of spirituality. But let me talk to you. These were not just down and out people. These were high level religious leaders. Very intellectual mindsets. You know, in their day and age, there were doctors and there were lawyers. And there were scribes. And there were professionals. And there were wealthy people. And there were people that basically, outside of the customs and the time frame, are no different than you and I. They were the young and they were the old. They were the seasoned and not so seasoned in life. They were the successful and they were those that not so much so. But here he comes. And somehow they must have thought to themselves, what I have is good enough. I have religion. I have. I go to the synagogue. I go do this. I go do that. From a child I learned this verse. From a child I learned that verse. You know, and... And so Jesus addresses later on in the Gospels. He says, you know not the scriptures, nor the power of God. But he doesn't want to, and he's encouraging us not to miss, that we would wake up and not miss something, something very important. What is that, Pastor Hart? 
his visitation with you. His visitation with you. That whether you've ever mentioned it to anybody in this room or anybody you know very close or even love very dearly, your heart longs for and, and God knows that. But what he's, what he's trying to get you to understand is the word peace means nothing missing, nothing broken. His peace brings healing. His peace is his salvation. His peace restores your marriage. His peace brings the love back that you thought is so far gone. His peace will bring your child back from, from wherever. And I'm here to tell you, his peace does what no man can do. Because if he didn't have, as it says here, the things that make for your peace, he has the things that you don't have. He has the things that make for your peace. You don't have them. That's why he came, because you didn't have them, but he had them, and he loved you enough to want to give them to you so you would have nothing missing and nothing broken. He doesn't want your life broken. He doesn't want your mind broken. He doesn't want your body broken. He doesn't want your family broken. He doesn't want anything on your life broken. Do you hear what I'm saying? He is the God of peace that comes to deliver and to set free with his salvation. And he came, and in the power of they knew he was going to come, he says, I am here. And they did not recognize the day of their visitation. Before we throw stones too far, yeah, if I was there, I would have. Would you have? Would you? Is it any different from today? Because they maybe, I'm sure they were good people. I'm sure they were good mothers, good fathers, good business people, good young people, good whatever professionals. So what is it? They weren't all evil people. They all wanted, you know, and needed, but... For some reason, they were what? Distracted. Something was missing. And uh, that's why I want to talk to you. I want to minister on recognizing those moments, those incredible moments when he wants to visit with you because there is something called the high cost of low enthusiasm. Let me help you to understand what's going on here. Enthusiasm is a key word. I want to show you in Scripture so that you and I, by the Holy Spirit, won't miss these moments where he wants to visit you and speak to you and do what only he can do. See, when we don't respond to God when he speaks to us, because it's not on our time frame, it's not how we expect it, because it's not how we've seen it done. You could be missing the day of your visitation because of a mindset that you have. And, um, but he came as he did for them. He came, he proved why he came. He came to heal, he came to deliver, he came to cast out demons, he came to raise the dead, he came to make people whole, and yet they did not receive him. And, um, and it's important because when he speaks to you and we don't listen, then everything that can change um, from, re from weeping to rejoicing stays in the arena of weeping and no rejoicing. When he comes, he comes to, and he looks at the ashes that you're looking at and he says, I came to make that beautiful. I came to change your mourning into joy. I came to take the sickness out and bring healing. I came to bring the fractures of your life and make you whole. I came to put things together. But when you don't understand the time or the moment or the day, your day. See, this is God speaking to you. Before you say, I wish Joey was here. Or I wish, you know, Martha was here. Or I wish Timo was here because they need to hear this. No, no, if you're saying that, it's because you need to hear that. Yeah, yeah, because you're here. But there's a reason you're here. And it's important that we, you and I see this. So we want to 
overcome what I refer to as the high cost of low enthusiasm for God. I would think that that's what took place when Jesus said, wow, you didn't recognize, I told you who I was. I proved to you who I was. I said, I don't do one thing that the Father hasn't told me to do. I told Philip, I said, Philip, I've been with you all this time. Do you not recognize me? Again and again and again for three years, three and a half years, he proved who he was. He proved that he was direct line. He says, I don't do a thing that my father hasn't told me to do. I don't say a thing that my father hasn't told me to say. I've come not for my own glory. I come not for my own honor. I've come to demonstrate how much my father loves you and I love you. And so in, I want to go to a story in 2 Kings chapter 13. And I want to kind of flesh this out a little bit to help you and I to understand some things. And so it's a story of a prophet by the name of Elisha. And at this point, where I'm going to pick up the story in just a minute, he's lying on his deathbed. He's about ready to expire in his life. He's had a very fruitful, very powerful, very dynamic life. Elisha had twice the miracles of Elijah. So, but now he's at the point where his life is about ready to cease. Something very powerful happens here. And I want to try to help you and I to maybe understand so the Bible speaks about this younger king by the name of King Joash, king of Israel. And he came one day running because in those days, in the Old Testament, it would be a prophet who would be the voice of God, a prophet who would get a hold of the will of God and this and the other. And one day, this King Joash came in dreadfully afraid and the spirit of what I would call fear had overtaken him because he heard that the Syrian armies were lining up against the rumors of war were true. And maybe people came in from different places as they're getting closer, King Joash. We've got to do something, but look at the size of our army. So King Joash did not know what to do. And so King Joash, as many kings along those lines would do, they'd go to the, the prophet of God. Somebody who had a reputation, say reputation, reputation. say integrity, yes. and he did. And so King Joash, you know, realizes that he is overwhelmed. He is overwhelmed, the look on his face. So he busts down the door, so to speak, you know, and he breaks in. And where's the man of God? But he's lying on his deathbed. He's lying completely on his deathbed. Any moment. He's about ready to take his last breath. But then, because the King Joash came running, came seeking God, even though he was overwhelmed, um, what ended up happening is something began to stir in the prophet Elisha. And so the Syrian army, you have to realize, was a very, very evil army. We'll get to that in just a second. Let me read a couple of verses and let's get us caught up here. I'm going to read 2 Kings chapter 13, beginning with verse 14. I encourage you to go back in your own time, read the entire story, put it all in context, take time to meditate, dwell on it, and receive. It says in verse 14 that Elisha became, sorry, had become sick with an illness of which he would die. And just a few verses later, at least how it's laid out in Scripture, he did. Then Joash, the king of Israel, came down to him. And wept over his face and said, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. That was a way of declaring, I can see you are at the point of death. But he was saying it in desperation because he didn't have another voice. My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. And Elisha said to him, Take a bow and some arrows. So he took himself a bow and some arrows. Because now you're going to see the unorthodox. The strange. The not normal as a person would say. And um, you'll see the hand of God move. And he took himself a bow and some arrows. And then he said to the king of Israel, 
put your hand on the bull. So he put his hand on it. And Elijah put his hands on the king's hands. Now here comes a king, the king of Israel at that moment. Desperately tormented because the Syrian army was a demonic and evil um, army for sure. In those days, back in the history of what we read in the Old Testament, the armies opposed to God would oftentimes inject themselves or take potions. They would conjure up spirits of witchcraft to numb themselves, to empower themselves, so they thought. They would take a long time in preparation for the battles they were going to go to. It was very, very gruesome. Extremely gruesome, you know. Um, and so they would try to conjure up. And Syri Syrian, the Syrian army had, had a history of being super evil with, um, with Israel. It's basically, it's, it's the powers of darkness in the worst kind of expression with demonic activity. I mean, this has been proven. This is uh, not a... Not a there are times that history says that these men would jump over the first line of people just the, almost in a supernatural way, you know, and there's demonic activity. I don't want to get into all that. But in the point I'm trying to share with you is, is uh, so, and they were a whole lot more than what King Joash and his army were. They were all, they had taken other nations, Syria, and they had a reputation of tormenting and destroying everything in its sight. Children and wives and just, just pillaging in every ugly way. You need to get that picture because that's why King Joash, his army was smaller. It wasn't as big. He didn't have the mighty men, didn't have all the chariots like that, didn't have all the horsemen, didn't have all the, the battle-scarred, evil, scarred face hardened kind of warriors coming against children of Israel. So he goes to the prophet. I guess that gives you a good picture. And, um, and the prophet does something to him. He says, take these natural weapons. I mean, what is a bow and arrows going to do against the mighty armies of the most sophisticated technology in that day coming against him? Ah, but this is where you have to read the word. And it says, Elisha said to him, O king of Israel, put your hand on the bow. He puts his hand on the bow and, and on it. Of course, he already had the arrows in his other hand. And, and so he put his hand on the bow and Elijah put his hands on the king's hands. Now, one other translation says that the prophet came. Think about this. Out of his deathbed, so now Elisha, let me put this picture together. Elisha is no longer operating as a feeble old man. I can barely make it out of my bed, but I'll get there. You know, there's something that came on. It's called the Spirit of God. I'm going to prove something to you. It was really fun, but just a second. Hold on. I'm going to make a movie out of this one. Anyways, um... And, and he gets up, and, 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 and the king sees he gets up. But in one translation, it says that the prophet comes and wraps his arms around him. And with one hand, he puts his hand on the bowl with Joash's hand on the bowl. With the other hand, he wraps around him, and he puts his hand on top of Joash's hand to pull the arrows, which is symbolic of God saying, you're going to hear in just a second. Joash, I am with you, the Lord your God. Joash, though you hold these natural weapons, I am putting my covering on you, my blessing on you, my authority on you. I am demonstrating and showing you symbolically, but I'm showing you that you are going to go to battle with the evil, but in my power, you will defeat them. It is not the bow and it's not the arrow. It is by my might 
It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, say the Lord. Give the Lord a big hand clap. So he's saying, your hands are like my hand. Your bow is not the natural. That's never going to deliver you. It will never set you free. It will never bring you the victory. I will. And he put him around him so he would know he's covered. And this is the king. And in the natural, he realizes, where did this guy get his strength? He's got his arms around me because he's a prophet. And he's operating under the anointing. Say the anointing. Meaning the Holy Spirit. And God's empowered him. Why? Because God loves his people. God loves his nations. God loves America. God loves, you know, people. He doesn't want to see them destroyed. But it's a type and shadow of how we have to come against the powers of darkness that would come against you. God says, I am here to fight for you. I am here to fight through you. I am here to speak through you, Joash. Follow me, Joash. Now, this is important that you follow this. Now, watch. Very simple. We're going to read it right here. Again, he says, you know, I am your, basically saying, I am your deliverer. I am your shield. I am your strength. I am your power. I am your might. Your, I am your victory. I am your confidence. It's not the size of your army. It's the size of your God. It's the size of the covenant. It's the size. It's not the size of your bows and arrows. It's not what flesh and blood says, how they voice. It is I. Put your eyes on me. Know that you are covered today, son. And God's speaking to people here in this room. Verse 17, let's pick it up right there. And he says, and Elijah said, open the east window. And he opened it. Then Elijah said, shoot. For those of you local, not shoots. <laughs> shoots, bro. This guy's from Hawaii. No, 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 sorry. No, 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 no. Um, yeah. It says, uh, then Elijah said, shoots. No, no, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Then Elijah said, now you got me caught. I'm pulling out now, okay? Then Elijah said, shoot. And he shot. And he said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria, for you shall, now listen, for you must strike the Syrians at Aphek until you have destroyed them. Now listen, I, I put emphasis on my notes. I don't know how it's behind me, but the point I'm trying to share with you, notice what, this is the prophet. Get a hold of this. This is the prophet who's on the verge of passing over to the other side. And suddenly this strength comes out of him. Puts his arms around him. But all of a sudden, the strength of his voice comes to him. Y'all got to hear this now. And, uh, and he says, the arrow, symbolic, is the arrow of your deliverance. The arrow is the arrow of the Lord's deliverance over Syria. As massive as they are. I can imagine that King Joash said, to some degree. And then, with a strong voice, what you would naturally see as a feeble prophet at the end of his days, says with a very strong voice by the Holy Spirit, for you must strike. You must strike. You must strike Syria until you have wiped them out. In other words, he's saying, don't play with evil. Don't tolerate sin. Don't tolerate, you know, demon activity as if it's something you can negotiate with. Don't go halfway. Go all the way. And he uses this strength that he has. And he's speaking to a man that, you know, doesn't quite understand, you know, how he's going to win when he gets there. Then God begins to show and manifest and visit him. And visit him in the most, most unordinary way. And he says, you must. And he said it with great passion. He said it with great enthusiasm. And again, because of the history of Syria, in verse 18, be the last verse, I believe. Two more verses. It says, then he said, take, which means grip, grasp, or lay hold of, the arrows, so he took them. 
And he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground. He said, strike the ground. See, the Bible says in Isaiah 59, God has vengeance against his enemy, not flesh and blood, but against the principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness that try to dominate flesh and blood. God does not tolerate the mockery of demon powers. Do you hear what I'm saying? And so it's important that you and I understand. So he says, strike the ground. He told him what to do. Two things that he has just done that I want you to get a hold of. He says, strike the ground. And then it says that the man, and then, of course, where is it? So he struck three times and he stopped. Elijah rises out of his deathbed, gives him an incredible visual, a metaphor for you and I, a visual wrapping literally his arms around him. And then just went through all of that. And then he says, strike the ground with great passion. And King Joash goes, tap, tap, tap. Tap, tap, tap. Cool, cool, cool. Nice, nice, nice. Hmm. So, what's going on? Listen, the prophet, still the prophet, verse 19. And the man of God was angry. This is the Lord, angry. Angry with King Joash. And he said, you should have struck five, six times. And you would have struck Syria until you had destroyed it the way I told you. But now you will strike Syria only three times. Meaning you will have three engagements with them, but you will not defeat them. God is visiting in that unusual circumstance of what Elijah was, you know, Elijah was operating in. King Joash was having a visitation. And when God shows him two things, say two things, he shows them his vision and he shows them how to be passionate for the vision. You know, the vision that he had for his victory. Now, Elijah says, he actually goes back to bed. And he says, what was that? What's up? You know, what a foolish act. Where's your enthusiasm? Didn't you come in here saying that the massive armies are coming against you? And God gives you a visual? And then he tells you to carry out this vision with passion and desire. And you go, tap, tap, tap. You said you want a miracle and you asked for a, a tap, tap, tap. Wow. You want an intervention of God and you go, what? Tap, tap, tap. Tap, tap, tap with a little cappuccino on the side. Yeah. You know, where's your expectation is what he's saying. Where's your expectation? Why are you so apathetic? Why are you lethargic? Why are you passive? Why are you lukewarm? Where's your intensity? Why are you so mundane? You say you want to win the world. You say you want God to intervene on your family. And you pray, tap, tap, tap. You come to church and tap, tap, tap. You know? And so God is trying to speak because my friends, there's a high cost to be paid for low enthusiasm. So the level of his intensity and the level of his intensity or lack thereof is the level of his deliverance. God says, you know what, King Joash? See, because your outward demonstration oftentimes reveals your inward condition. In other words, what you do on the outside reveals what your heart's really like on the inside. And that's really what God's after. He's not asking you to have a personality change. 
But he's asking, where's your conviction? Where's your fire? Where's your passion? Why don't you have it? What tainted you? What has a hold of you? Why are you so dis? Why do you constantly put me on hold? Why do you constantly, when I want to visit you, you're not ready? I'll talk to you when you read your word, but you don't read your word. I'll talk to you when you pray, but you don't want to pray. I'll talk to you in service, but you can't because you got to go to a golf game. You know, I can't, I can't, I can't. And God says, I've constantly wanted to visit with you to heal your family, to heal your marriage, to heal your heart, to bring deliverance to your child. And all you give me is tap, 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 tap. You treat me with a tap, tap, tap until you think you're ready. Well, I decide when I am ready, and I've always been ready, but apparently you cannot discern the time of your visitation. He's not talking down. He's trying to pull you up. He's trying to encourage you. It's important that you and I understand. Listen, I have, made, I have shared that there are two indispensable truths for your victory, passion, and vision, or vision and passion. When, when Elijah spoke to King Joash, he painted a picture which was God's vision. He wanted darkness driven out. He didn't want the children of Israel, you know, to be abused, misused, tormented, killed, mutilated in so many different ways. You can't approach your world with tap, tap, tap. And you have to understand. And then he says, strike the ground. And he wants tap, tap, tap. Why? Well, you see, vision, we said, is something you see. Passion is something you feel. Without passion, you know, vision without passion will produce stagnation. And passion without vision will produce frustration. They work together. Vision and passion working together. Then you have a people that can change the world. Not by your power, but by his vision, his word, and his spirit. And it's not going to be done with a tap, 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 brother and sister. You're never going to get rid of sin with a tap, tap, tap. You're never going to get rid of addiction with a tap, tap, tap. You're not going to get rid of a devil with a tap, tap, tap. You're not going to get healed in your body with a tap, tap, tap. You're not going to have your marriage restored with a tap, tap, tap. You're never going to be the man you need to be as a husband with a tap, tap, tap. You're never going to be the wife you can be without a tap, tap, tap. You've got to be who God said you are, and it's going to require more than a tap, tap, tap. And it's important that you and I understand, you know, the great... The great William Booth, wow, the great William Booth talked about passion. Many of you know William Booth is the one who started the Salvation Army. He was so on the edge in his day. I mean, he said, I don't pray to God for revival. I am revival. And he had a beard that went about that long. I mean, he was like, he was way ahead of some of you all. Anyways, um, good looking though. But he said this one time. He says, some men passion is gold. Some men's passion is fame. My passion is souls. God loves with a great love the man whose heart is bursting with passion for the impossible. You know, I'm talking about the high cost the Lord's trying to warn you from. Don't go there of low enthusiasm. I once heard it said that we are born, we live, and we die. We cannot do anything about being born or about dying, but we can do something about how we live. It was Ralph Waldo Emerson who once said, enthusiasm is one of the most powerful engines of success. When you do a thing, do it with all your might. Put your whole soul into it. Stamp it with your own personality. Be active, 
Be energetic. Be enthusiastic. Be faithful. And you will accomplish your objective, I should say. Nothing great was ever achieved without enthusiasm. Turn to your neighbor and say, no tap tap here. <laughs> Amen. So Elijah says to King Joash, hey, you're not excited? You're not enthusiastic? He said, now you're going to face the Syrian army three times, but you won't destroy them. They'll continue to hassle. They'll continue to disturb. They'll continue to disrupt because you did not make your mind up to buy all in what God had said. God would have, I guess Elijah was saying, given you total victory, but you weren't serious enough. He visited you, showed you his vision, told you how to carry it out with his passion. And you just thought, oh, it's another moment. Oh, it's just another service. Oh, it's just another time. Oh, it's just another event. What are you doing when you do that? Tap, tap, tap. You thought your response or your reaction was un goes unnoticed, but God noticed it. And he said, you could have had more, but you weren't hungry enough. You weren't desperate enough. You didn't want enough. So you've got to ask yourself the question throughout your journey of your life. Not just here in Hawaii or in this service. At times, you'll have to ask, where did my want to, to want to, go to? Some of you lost your want to. You know you need to, but you don't have a want to enough yet to desperately desire. And what ends up happening, and in the name of Jesus, it will not take place here, but what ends up happening is you're just going through the motions. And sometimes church people, like you, good people, like you, you know, of so many wonderful backgrounds and truly born again people, you get into this, this motion. And sometimes that's what you do in your praise. You know, you're going through the motions. That's what you do in your worship. You're going through the motions. That's what you do in your offering. You're going through the motions. That's what you do in service. You're going through the motions. That's what you do at life groups. You're going through the motions. That's what you do with, uh, what, let me just throw out the 40, the 40th anniversary of men. You're going through the motions. Oh, yeah, yeah. A lot of other people go to the blaze. A lot of other people do that. Tap, tap, tap. King Joas, you know, he says, these arrows are the deliverance of the Lord. You should have come alive when God gave you the visual. You know, you should have gotten excited. He was endeavoring to breathe confidence in you, strengthen you. What is driving you, Joash? You know, you should have got pumped. You should have got lit. You should have got on fire. I don't know how you want to say it. Anyways, it's important that you and I see this. He says, Joash, Joash, Joash. God's plan and vision for you to have much more, but your lack of enthusiasm is going to cost you the high cost of low enthusiasm. You know, many of you already know this. I mean, enthusiasm, E-N, in the Greek stands for, you know, in, of course, I-N, and theos refers to God, capital. It really means, defined in the Greek, the, the fullness of God. Something else King Joash was full of. There's a lot of people who are full of stuff. You can hear it when they talk. You can hear the tap, tap, tap coming out of their mouth. They talk and all you hear is tap, tap, tap. <laughs> you know? Well, I can't do that. Tap, tap, tap. Well, I don't know if I can go to church. Tap, tap, tap. Well, you know, God is going to move and God is going to visit and God's going to show up and we've been preparing and we've been, a, and you go, I'll see if I can tap, tap, tap. I'll see if my chronos schedule can fit into God's Cairo schedule. Why don't you just sit down for a while because it ain't going to work. 
It could be that uh, maybe, well, we can't say too much about Joe Ash. And again, I want to make sure you understand me. I'm not talking about you changing some kind of personality uh, bent about yourself. You know, but you need to hear that so many times we get caught up going in emotions. And because we think that the disturbance, the interruption, the distraction is just natural. Really? So God's heard for months now that we are going to, we're praying and we're fasting and we're interceding. We are. We are praying, we are fasting, and we are interceding for a visitation upon your life. We're preparing with the vision he has shared with us, the vision meaning his outpouring, his presence, his goodness, celebrating not an event, but the King of kings and the Lord of lords. For one specific targeted time, expecting for God, praying that you would break through every obstacle, praying. So it's a moment of visitation, like in the days of old in the Old Testament, when God would say, you know, you need to come on this day, at this time, in this place, so that we can celebrate the Passover. It was an appointment with God, you know, or maybe it's um, the day of Pentecost. It was an appointment with God because when they came with an expectation to that place at that time, you know, with that purpose, they expected God to show up and God did show out. And so we see this but appointments with God, visitations with God. Now let me come back to you. It's important that you and I understand why do you have a tap, tap, tap mentality? It's not because you're a bad person. I don't think that at all. I really don't. I think you just don't understand why the enemy is trying to tap you out. I just don't think you're reading your life as if it's natural and you're compartmentalizing God maybe on a Sunday morning and that's, that's wonderful to have you here. But many in this room may have, I don't know your story, have missed your visitation because you've had a tap, tap, tap mentality. And God has endeavored to share with you. What is he sharing with Joash? Can I tell you? Thank you for allowing me. And that is this. Hey, Joash, I want to do great things through you. I want to bring great power through you. I want to do things that make up for your peace. I want to do things through your life because your life counts, Joash. I love you, Joash. You're the king. You're the one I've set to influence the nation of Israel. You're the one that's called to be raised up. And I need you to be an influencer to your generation. I need you to breathe life upon the children of Israel. I need a true leader. I need someone who will step up. But you can't do it without me covering you. You can't do it without my hands on top of you. It's not about the arrow and the bow. It's not about your tap, tap, tap. It's about my vision for you. It's about my passion for you. It's about what I want to do. I am calling, he says, an exceeding great army to rise up in the name of Jesus in this day and hour to begin to say, I will tap, tap, tap no more. Right. Right. You said, oh, that's an interesting story. You're tapping. You can never understand the things of the Spirit of God with a natural mind. Stop it. Stop it because God wants you delivered. You can't figure out what he wants to do. Because let me finish the story since you're going to let me. Because did you know that in a few, right after that verse, Elisha dies. They bury him. I mean, bury, graveyard bury. Well, I want to read it to you since you want to know. Because this is, this is Shahalibotushalaba. <laughs> what is that? I don't know, but it felt good. Anyways, um, I'm going to pick up in verse 20. And it says, then Elisha died and they buried him. And a raiding bands of Moabs invaded the land in the spring of the year. Verse 21. So it was as they were burying the, a man. Sorry, it's not coming up. I didn't know I was going to do it. 
But this is freebie for all of you because you're special. Anyways, shoots. Anyways, uh, so it was um, as they were burying a man. They were burying somebody else. Say somebody else. Apparently, it was the same kind of grave. Watch this. This is incredible. You got re- to open your Bibles. This is like, you're not going to believe. You're going to think I'm making this up. You're welcome, Sammy. It says, so it was as they were burying a man that suddenly they spied a band of raiders and they put the man in the tomb of Elijah who was dead. He was graveyard dead. Watch. It says this. And when the man the other dead man was put on top of Elisha. Watch this. It's, this is so powerful. I mean, ah! the Bible doesn't make sense, but something lights up when you read it. It's called your spirit, man. It says, and when the man was let down and he touched the bones of Elijah, the dead man revived and stood to his feet. A dead man's bones had enough anointing on the inside of it to bring healing and to bring life. My gosh, if a dead man's bones of a prophet of a day of old can do that, imagine what Jesus can do for you right now. Imagine the healing power of what he can do right now. I said right now. I said right now. The healing power of God. Oh my gosh, I wouldn't get too worked up about the dead man's bones, but I would get worked up about a resurrected Savior by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth and the power of his blood. Somebody just shout, just, a, just give me 30 seconds of a shout. Give me 30 seconds of a shout. Lord, we praise you and we thank you.